What's going on everyone, Charlie here. We're gonna talk about ETF liquidity, the mechanics of ETF trading. This may be something that you um, should know or maybe you've had questions about. Let's go ahead and look into it. So, the creation and redemption process. There's two markets. We have the primary market, which is where authorized participants create redeem shares for ETFs. And we have the secondary market, which is where you and I trade. Now, becoming familiar with the ETF creation and redemption process is key to understanding the true extent of an ETF's overall liquidity and achieving more efficient execution from a wider selection of funds. The creation and redemption process for ETFs takes place in the primary market and is facilitated by authorized participants, otherwise known and abbreviated as APs. Now, APs are entities chosen by an ETF sponsor like BlackRock or State Street to undertake, or I should say iShares or State Street, to undertake the responsibility of obtaining the underlying assets. So, APs are the ones chosen by the ETF issuers, such as iShares, that undertake the responsibility of obtaining the underlying assets needed to create an ETF. Authorized participants are typically large institutional organizations, such as market makers. Creation is the process by which APs introduce additional shares to the secondary market. During this process, APs deliver the underlying securities to the fund sponsor in return for ETF shares. For redemptions, APs deliver ETF shares to the fund sponsor in return for the underlying securities. These transactions are executed in large increments, known as unit sizes, which vary from 25,000 to 100,000 shares. The ability to introduce additional shares to the marketplace on a daily basis demonstrates precisely why ETF trading volume is not an all-encompassing measure of the fund's overall liquidity. In order to understand the full liquidity of an ETF, investors must also consider the liquidity of its underlying securities. Now, why does an AP create or redeem ETF shares? There are a number of reasons why this happens, including arbitrage, inventory management, customer facilitation, and create to lend. The two reasons that are the most applicable to investors you and I, customer facilitation and arbitrage. Now, what's happening in the market right now is the creation to lend. Now, customer facilitation, authorized participate, uh, participants have the ability to create or redeem ETF shares for clients in order to access additional liquidity beyond the secondary market. For example, if a superannuation fund is interested in acquiring $50 million of ETF XYZ, they may consider working with an AP to facilitate a creation. Now, why does an AP create or redeem shares continue? Arbitrage is another reason. APs can create or redeem ETF shares in order to take advantage of potential arbitrage opportunities. Now, an example of arbitrage, it, let's say shares of ETF XYZ are trading at 55 bucks in the secondary market where you and I trade, and the value of the underlying securities is 54.95. There is an inherent arbitrage opportunity here. That five cent difference can be exploited, basically. That's arbitrage. Now, in order to realize this opportunity, the AP would sell ETF shares at $55 and hedge their position by buying the corresponding underlying basket of securities for $54.95, thus locking in the $0.05 cent profit. The AP can deliver the underlying securities to the fund sponsor in return for ETF shares in order to flatten out their short positions in the ETF. So hopefully that explains a lot about the shorting and uh, of the ETFs that's been going on. Now this hypothetical example above results in a 0.05% profit or a 0.05 cent profit for the authorized participant. The key takeaway for investors is that this process keeps the ETF market price in line with the value of its underlying securities due to the consistent arbitrage opportunity for APs and institutional trading desks. This is the diagram of the primary and secondary market where the ETF trading mechanics take place. This is your AP here, your market maker, this is your transfer agent custodian here. Um, this is where the transfer of ETF shares and physical securities and or cash are, are, are done. Then you have your ETF sponsor here. And then you have your ETF creation process right here. And on this side in the secondary market where you and I trade, this is the exchange and other trading venues. Investor gives cash. Broker dealer gives the ETF shares. Market maker puts cash in to the authorized participants. And then the ETF shares go out to the market maker. Now again, remember, Market makers can be authorized participants. They can also play the role of market maker. They're not the same thing, but market makers typically play the role of AP. Now, bid-ask spreads. 
The ask is the price at which an investor can buy ETF shares and the bid is the price at which they can sell. The difference between the bid and the ask is called the spread, which indicates the overall cost of transacting in any security plus any applicable brokerage commission costs. Now, if we're not talking ETFs, we're talking straight market makers, the bid ask spread is where they make their profit majority of the time. Now, what does this represent? Well, the ETF bid ask spread reflects execution costs, market risk, and the bid ask spreads of the underlying securities in the ETF basket. These variables are all considered when institutional trading desks make markets for investors. Like most businesses, the cost to the end consumer is highly correlated to input costs. In this respect, ETF trading is no different from any other business. Therefore, ETF traders need to account for different categories of cost when facilitating ETF trades. Therefore, ETF traders need to account for different categories of costs. Again, these categories are creation and redemption fees. This is a fixed cost that the ETF sponsor charges to an authorized participant to create or redeem ETF shares. The fee varies amongst funds and is a cost per order, not per creation or redemption unit. Fees generally range from several hundred dollars to several thousand dollars depending on the ETF and its asset class. Another reason of cost would be the spread of underlying securities in an ETF basket. Now the bid ask spreads of the underlying securities directly impact the cost of the market makers to trade the ETFs. These costs tend to be greater for less liquid, esoteric asset classes such as emerging market equities or high yield credit. If a market maker has to obtain a portion of the ETF constituents on the secondary market to then deliver into the fund as part of the basket process, the cost of acquiring those names should be reflected in the ETF's bid ask spread, as costs are traditionally passed through to the end customer. Then you have risk. At times, market risk can have major impact on spreads, especially during periods of elevated market volatility. During these times, market makers are forced to widen their spreads in order to include a buffer for the additional market volatility. In order to hedge their risk and make orderly markets when trading, market makers will use an array of tools, underlying securities or correlated proxies, such as index futures or other ETFs. This hedging cost will include an, in an ETF spread and also be passed along to the investors trading in the secondary market. Now, buying and selling ETFs. There are two layers of liquidity within an ETF, available liquidity in the secondary market where you and I trade and liquidity of the underlying securities. In order to access all available pools of ETF liquidity, it is important to understand the various ways investors can buy and sell ETFs. Now, the majority of ETF orders are entered electronically, obviously, and match orders placed by natural buyers cannot be from an algorithm retail order and sellers in the secondary market where participants post bid and offer quotes at price levels that they are willing to buy or sell a particular number of shares at for a given ETF. There are a number of different order types that can be used in the secondary market. Most investors utilize limit orders, which are orders to buy or sell a stated amount of securities at a specified price or better. Now, in summary, ETFs trade like equity securities. Investors and advisors should remember that ETFs are purchased, sold, and settled like an equity security. When buying or selling an ETF, investors should consider all of the factors they would consider when buying or selling a stock, as well as additional factors such as the total overall liquidity of the ETF. Extreme volatility means information flow can be less efficient. Under the efficient market hypothesis, the stock market is viewed to be efficient and to reflect all publicly available information on securities. In periods of distress, like when there's shit tons of gaps everywhere, the markets typically become less efficient. As a result of uncertainty, in the broader markets, one may see a bid ask spread or premium slash discounts to ETF NAVs widen for periods of time, and NAV stands for net asset value. Typically, these are temporary events. The extent to which the spreads widen is typically directly related to the perceived risk or volatility of the asset class. Then lastly, ETFs trade effectively even in volatile environments. In the wake of periods of volatility, ETF trading volumes increase sharply as investors look to ETFs for their key attributes of transparency and liquidity. ETFs can also function as price discovery tools, providing insights into the market view or the market's view on correct market pricing, even during periods when the underlying liquidity for an asset class is diminished. So there you have it. 
That should have hopefully taught you something about ETFs and their liquidity and how they trade and operate on the markets. They, uh, yeah, ETFs are great. Go, let's go. Very good.